diversified at, at this point in time. Advertising is, uh, has been digital only up until now, um, but it'll become a bigger portion. But our uh, reader revenue program is, uh, is growing. Um, it, it would have, uh, it, might, it might be more than commercial revenue this year. Um, so that's, there's a nice sort of diversified uh, mix of revenue there for us. So, but it'll be the, the newspaper is an ad model, com complete ad model. So, yeah. Cool. Can't wait to hear more from you in the call. Thanks. Cool. So we're just waiting for Nigel, but uh, I think in terms of an audiovisual and technology standpoint, you guys are all comfortable and, and we're good, right? Sure, yeah. Perfect. We'll just give Nigel another minute or two. But uh, at this stage, because we know your, your audio and, and tech is working, if you want to switch off your video for a bit, finish up some tasks. I know we've called you in early. Um, we will go live in eight minutes, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then once we go live, we'll give it about one or two minutes or up to three minutes for people to join in. And then I'll do a quick intro, hand it over to Nancy, and then you guys can begin the conversation. Hi, Nigel. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, good. Not too bad. This is Ali Khan from Nairobi. Good to see you. We're glad you made it um, online. No, yeah. No, thank you. I'm in the middle of homeschooling. So, yeah, it's um, inter oh. interesting times. <laughs> that cannot I'm be also easy. Yeah, yeah. No, no. You know what? Uh, I have the utmost respect for teachers now. <laughs> don't we all i mean we all just want kids to go back to school <laughs> no i well <laughs> yeah yeah how are you guys doing though good great and it's so nice to have you thank you for joining us no thank you for then i i see you guys are social distancing <laughs> we're trying our best we have our sanitizer right here um yeah nancy's keeping it closer to her she's not sharing yeah. <laughs> you were about to make yeah. a statement nigel you prefer homeschooling uh over the, to physical or or uh you, you know what i'm i'm just i mean i've got a six-year-old so i you know I, I just um i you know we took the kids to um you know to 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 my parents house and they live about 10 minutes 
drive from 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 home and by the time we got there they'd um swapped masks you know so i i don't know if going to school is gonna work <laughs> brilliant <laughs> I, I, I just can't see it happening. <laughs> <laughs> Have they made an announcement on when school to resume uh, down there? Uh, yeah, they have, but, you know, you know, um, they have. And they were meant to go in, go back to school in November. Uh, mm. But I'm struggling to see how that's going to work. Yeah. Yeah, what's, what, what, what are you guys doing up there? They're looking at uh, sometime next in October. I think they're, they're looking at schools resuming in October, but a lot of other a lot of us are apprehensive about what that will look like. Uh, uh, there's been I, 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 no preparation, no yes, exactly. To, yeah, you know what this would mean. Um, you know, right from school transport to yes. classrooms. You know the different scenarios. Yeah. Uh, yes, to the social exactly. distancing. You know, there's just a lot yeah. uh, that hasn't been thought out. Uh, yes. Or different scenarios that have been built uh, to look at what yes. that might look like. So a lot yeah. of parents are just thinking they would rather have their kids at home and yes. wait, wait this out until next year and see what that looks like. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I agree. It's, 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 not, it's not worth it. And the numbers are going up. You know, um, yeah. we kind yeah. of had stabilized, but this, this last week we can see a rise in, in, the, in the cases. So that, that's also a little... Mm -hmm. a little that's worrying. Yeah. 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 No, it, it's, yeah. Uh, no, it, it, no, it would. So, so it, this is just meant to be like a conversation, right? Yes, it is a conversation. So we will Ex we're not spend too much time introducing you guys because you know, just your profiles will take us the whole time uh, to get yeah. on. So we'll just focus, yeah. we'll just introduce you by name and, and, and yeah. the organization that you come from, and then we'll give you five to seven minutes to articulate, you know, what you're doing in your space uh, towards media sustainability. Uh, what are the new things that you're experimenting with? Um, mm. You know, what are you learning from that? And, and how might we look at this a lot more differently? Because a lot of um, organizations in the region are struggling with, you know, how do you monetize uh, the media space? Uh, what are the new business models that we need to think about? And it would be nice yeah. for us to hear what different people are doing and just compare notes yeah. and see mm. what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. Great. No problem. Mm -hmm. No problem at all. Okay. We will go live in about a minute um, from the broadcast okay. room that we are in, and then mm -hmm. we'll give it about two or three minutes for people mm -hmm. to join. We'll have some music and have the poster up, and then we'll take all of that down. I'll do a quick hello and welcome everyone, pass it over to Nancy, and, and, and we'll start the conversation. No problem. No, 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 not with Corona. No, no? I already had COVID. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, let's do it.
Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're excited to host this conversation on media sustainability in Eastern and Southern Africa. We have an exciting lineup of speakers for you today. We have a great moderator and we're really, really excited for the diversity of perspectives in the room uh, with all of you. So please make use of the chat box, ask us any questions as we go along, uh, enjoy the conversation and feel free to contribute as we move. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Nancy Booker, to moderate the conversation. Thank you very much and a very good afternoon or good morning from wherever you're joining us. Uh, we're very delighted to host this webinar, which is a two-part series uh, of a conversation that started in July uh, when uh, our colleagues from the University of Johannesburg hosted the first webinar on uh, the questions around uh, press freedom in, in Eastern and Southern Africa. And so this is a second one that we are hosting. It's taken us about two months, two to three months, two months to get this underway. But we're very delighted uh, that we can have this today because we have some very good speakers uh, on, the, on the webinar with us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Nancy Booker and I work at the Nkani University Graduate School of Media and Communications in Nairobi. Um, so our webinar today is focusing on the media sustainability question in Eastern and, in Eastern and Southern Africa. And this is coming from the fact that uh, there has been a shift to the digital and online platforms within uh, the region, within the world. And, and this shift has presented numerous opportunities, but it has also brought to fore the, the whole question around media sustainability. And, and, and what this has been exacerbated by the fact that the COVID pandemic, you know, came in uh, into a context that was really struggling with uh, trying to figure out, you know, how do we cope with the technology, the disruptions that have been necessitated by technology. So that and COVID just then magnified, uh, you know, some of the challenges that the media in Eastern and Southern Africa uh, were dealing with diminishing audiences, diminish, uh, diminishing uh, revenue streams, um, you know, job losses, and just trying to figure out how do you remain afloat uh, at a time you know, when there's so much to contend with. Now, the challenge with a struggling media industry is that then it poses a threat to democracy and freedom of speech. And in the long term, this undermines the continent's development because development can only be realized when there is a diversity in, in media platforms, when we have many voices being heard. And that way then, we are able to empower citizens, not only through information, but also by being able to support disinformation and hold governments to account. Now, all this then necessitates the conversation that we'll be having uh, today with what we have termed uh, as media sustainability champions, people who are not sleeping, and you know the, this whole question keeps them awake at night, and I don't want to believe that that's true around the webinar this, this afternoon. So we are looking forward to a very exciting conversation. Um, the certain questions that we will be looking at in the wake of advertising and audience downtown resulting from the rise of the digital media what can be done to sustain quality, independent, and diverse reporting in the months and years to come? And there's some very good examples from some of our speakers this afternoon. The whole question of job losses, beyond safeguarding jobs, what can the media industry do to survive and grow on the other side of the pandemic? Is there any way in which we can harness the talent that is currently being lost uh, through the job cuts in the industry for the good of the digital space? And lastly, how are media industries in the two regions connecting with audiences and how do they ensure that their content is relevant and impactful? So we are hosting this conversation as at the Graduate School of Media and Communications in collaboration with our colleagues from the University of Johannesburg. Uh, I'm hoping that Dumi is already online and in partnership with OSF's program on independent journalism and two regional foundations, OSEA and OSISA. So the structure is that we will spend about, uh, we'll give each of our speakers, there are four of them, about five to seven minutes to articulate, uh, you know, what they're doing, what the challenges are, what are the, you know, what are the best practices, what are they learning, how are they failing forward, and, and what might we take away from that around, you know, the media sustainability question. And then we will follow that up with, uh, you know, some questions 
open it up for, uh, for our audience who's online uh, to, to ask some questions and then turn it back to uh, our four speakers to close this. And then Ali Khan will wrap it up, uh, you know, with some important takeouts from the session. Uh, so I'll introduce our speakers just by name, uh, in no particular order. Uh, Steely, uh, I'll pass his second name, uh, who's the publisher and CEO at the Daily Maverick. He'll help us uh, figure out how to pronounce his second name. He taught me just before the webinar, but I can tell you it's not easy. Our second speaker is uh, uh, Nigel Mugamu, who's a founder uh, at, at 263 Chat uh, in Zimbabwe. Our third speaker is Njoki Shege, who's my colleague and is a director at the Innovation Center at Dega Khan University, it's Graduate School of Media and Communications. And uh, my brother from uh, just across, Daniel Kalinaki, who's a general manager, um, editorial, Nation Media Group, Uganda. Thank you very much. Uh, lady and gentlemen for joining us uh, this afternoon. So I'll start this uh, uh, and I think I'll, I'll quickly have uh, uh, Steely uh, share with us what they're doing at the Daily Maverick uh, with regards to the media sustainability question. Uh, they seem to be doing a lot of great things down there and it would be nice for you to share with us what that looks like, what are some of the challenges, what are the highlights and what are some of those questions that we may need to uh, think about and bring forward? So over to you, Steve. Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you uh, for having me uh, here today to share some of our experiences in uh, basically what has been a 10 and a half year hustle uh, and struggle to survive. I think being born into uh, this uh, era of disruption, probably the greatest era of disruption in, in the media business um, that is being felt globally around the world, focusing on uh, digital publishing, uh, on politics in the Zuma and Zuckerberg era is probably a very brave slash stupid endeavor to have taken on. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 10 and a half years later, we are we are here. Um, we've learned some lessons along the way. And um, I think oh, the first lesson that uh, I'd like to share with you is that, um, you know, having struggled for so long in that space, trying to make the commercial side of the business work, um, almost, I guess, uh, maybe we, 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 we wallowed a little bit too much in the victimhood that, uh, we, you know, we're probably entitled to. Um, but I think once we stopped playing the victim card and figured out that this was our reality and we just needed to accept that, um, and we started leaning into the problem and realizing the only way uh, out is through, um, you know, we invested in uh, innovation and trying new things and we got smarter around uh, how we innovated, how we experimented. We weren't short of ideas, we weren't afraid to experiment, but I think uh, we lacked the methodology and the concepts behind product design thinking and launching new products in a, a much more structured way that was going to de-risk and make them uh, and make them more successful or give them a greater chance of success at least. Um, so I think what we did was we invested in uh, innovation, we invested in training, uh, we exposed ourselves to best practices from around the world and we selected from that which of those practices or those uh, revenue opportunities made sense for us. Um, we also realized that you know we needed to have a clearer vision of what the, the revenue situation needed to be. And so a couple of years ago, we, we came up with this idea of um, what we call the three to six uh, formation. So the football fans amongst us will know 442 and other uh, formations on the, on the football pitch and how you sort of structure your players and your, and your team. And so this concept of three to six uh, started becoming clear for us where we have the three, which is the, the three pillars um, of each types of revenue. And then within those three types of revenue, we were looking for two significant subtypes of that, which would then give us six significant individual revenue streams. But we needed that structure to know, okay, well, what are the three pillars or the three verticals that we want to, that we want to play in? And that of course is, is different for everyone. Uh, it's dependent on how you are funded. It's dependent on your political and legal environment. It's uh, dependent on your competitive landscape, the resources that you have available, the human and the technical. 
Um, and then putting all that into, into account with your editorial vision and the kind of uh, editorial focus you want to put out into the world and then coming up with what your own three to six looks like. And for us, the three is philanthropy, commercial activities and reader revenue. And we knew within each of those, we had to find two types. So philanthropy was approaching foundations and the others were individuals. Um, for commercial, we already had advertising and events were two pretty strong, strong types of revenue for us. And then within the reader revenue space uh, was the membership program for recurring support and then once off contributions uh, for that. And so our three to six started taking shape and we said, okay, well, we need to invest more resources in fundraising. We needed to restructure the, the organization so that the nonprofit would be able to help us access uh, more grant funding. Um, we were able to, you know, after quite a long period of time, uh, get some funding to get our investigative unit up and running our internship training program. And so, you know, we, we could see that with this vision in mind, the end of the three to six, we could start allocating resources and effort uh, into that. And so um, we'd, we'd already been pursuing commercial activities for, you know, since we started, uh, but uh, two, just over two years ago, the membership program uh, was launched uh, to our readership base off the back of a minimum viable product, uh, which was a recurring donation program that, that we had started while we were waiting for the technology stack to be upgraded and, and implemented for us to run a membership program. But we used that opportunity to test the concepts of uh, and the demand that would be uh, that would be rolled out. We used it as an opportunity to test uh, which benefits we thought uh, our members would like most. And we got that feedback from people who participated in the recurring revenue minimum viable product. And with that, we launched um, just over two years ago, the, the membership program. And, and I'm very um, happy to say that our, our lives have changed dramatically since that membership program has, has taken off, not only from a, a financial perspective, but we are operating as a completely different more audience centric, more data driven organization. And uh, the success of that membership program, we knew that if we got to a certain number of members, uh, five, 10,000, we're now at 14,000 members. Um, we knew that all these other opportunities would, <clears throat> would then uh, present themselves. And you know, once you have that sort of loyal and um, supportive base, uh, you can do a lot of stuff with that. And so when we wanted to, when we turned 10 years old, um, we wanted to put out a book that uh, would tell the story of Daily Maverick and the history of the country as they run side by side. And uh, we said, well, you know, we started looking around, you know, royalties as, as uh, authors doesn't really, you know, no one really makes money off uh, or being an author. And uh, we, we said, well, look, if we've already got so many members, why don't we just self-publish? And um, we, and we said, well, that's a great idea. We got pre-orders for the book. So, you know, we managed to recover all the costs of publishing that book before we even ordered the print, uh, uh, ordered the print run because our members were willing to support us and to, and to come in. And so um, we uh, self-published that book and we said, well, geez, we've just been through this whole uh, exercise of doing that maybe we can publish other people's books. And so we, we've just uh, had our second, uh, about to launch our second book now, which is a, an incredible story of a, a guy who was kidnapped uh, in Mali and held captive by Al Qaeda for six years. Um, and so we're getting to, to, to further our editorial vision of, of telling these great stories. But, you know, again, we've ordered pre-orders, uh, we've opened pre-orders uh, and that has been sort of de-risked that book project for us. And so having that, number and quality and level of support from a lot of people um we're able to launch these new products and new business units off the back of that and similarly the thinking was um with the launch of our newspaper this past weekend um we knew that uh 000 circulation number would be a good place to start it would be it would make a statement uh right out of the blocks uh, it would have a circulation bigger than titles that have been around for 30 years, 50 years, even 100 years. And, uh, and we knew that with 14,000 members, we'd have a great shot of, of being able to achieve that circulation number. And, you know, given the innovate, innovative distribution model that we decided to go with as well. So all, they're all linked. And so membership has now become uh, sort of the, 
the driving force behind so many of our initiatives and activities because it embodies two concepts um, that I think are important for publishers to um, to adopt and to and to really lean into if they are to be sustainable and that is data driven audience centricity um, and, and I think uh, as publishers as our uh, the good old days of advertising and, and cover price revenue uh, was really the two revenue streams that uh, media publishers had. Um, the new way is now that you need to have, you know, in our world, a three to six formation, other people call it an octopus, well, a diversified revenue stream that requires us to be entrepreneurial. It requires us to think about innovation, uh, continuous innovation, disruptive innovation, um, but also never losing sight of the fact that um, the concepts of data-driven audience centricity will be the things that, that keep us on the right path. And so as a North Star, that's something that is now that's becoming more ingrained in our practices and something that membership um, is built on. In order to do membership well, it can't be about just generating revenue. It needs to be about building community. Um, and the healthier and the stronger and the more engaged that community is, the more likely you are to get all the other benefits that accrue with building that community in that way. And, uh, and those would be financial or otherwise as, as our members collaborate and uh, engage with us on so many different levels, including editorial, uh, including volunteering, including offering their expertise um, and their knowledge as well. So um, that uh, for us is, is, is how we're approaching this and, and it's really just to get to the other side, you've just got to get through, you've got to, innovation has to be part of it, entrepreneurship has to be part of it, uh, product design thinking has to be part of it, but underpinned by uh, data-driven audience centricity. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, Steely, we'll come back to you with some questions, but I think what you've shared with us gives us a very good perspective of, of what, you're, what you're up to. Thank you. Um, Joki Shege, would you like to speak to us about the Innovation Center and uh, the activities that you've been working on, particularly with the, the innovators in residence and how that is contributing to media sustainability? Um, thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Definitely, I'd be willing to talk about um, what we do as Innovation Center. I believe you're now viewing my screen. Yes. yes. Super. Okay. So essentially, we are the Media Innovation um, Center from uh, the Aga Khan University Graduate School of Media and Communications. Um, the pillar upon which we are uh, founded and upon which we operate on is essentially media viability, um, which we understand to be the capacity of news media organizations to produce um, solid, high quality, independent journalism that is um, commercially sustainable. So that is what we understand media viability to be about. Um, so as you can see to my left, uh, that's uh, my team and I, um, we're a small team, but uh, it's really about how we see ourselves because we don't see ourselves as a small team. So a bit of background about the Innovation Center. Um, this is a KFW funded project to the Aga Khan um, University Graduate School of Media and Communications. Um, and on board, we have the Chivala Academy, that is DWA. Um, working together with us as an implementing and training partner. So Deutsche Vela is very, <clears throat> it's known for its uh, media development activities and they have come on board as our consultants um, to help us assemble a team of highly qualified um, trainers and, and coaches um, to our innovators in residence and our, um, and our community members. So exactly what do we do as the Innovation Center? <clears throat> so we are basically obsessed um, with understanding the future of journalism um, in East Africa. And in this regard, we are very actively supporting small media organizations or media startups 
as you would call them, um, through our Innovators in Residence program. So this is a one-year program in which we, <coughs> in which we invite, um, I'm sorry, <coughs> in which we invite uh, media ideas from across East Africa um, to pitch to our panel of judges after which we pick three winning ideas, one from each East African country and support them through a no uh, strings attached grant of up to $20,000. Um, we support them with coaching, um, training and mentorship. So in the background, you can see um, one of our innovators in residence team, that is the debunk media team um, led by Asha Mwilu to the right, um, to the far right. <clears throat> Asha Mulu is a journalist, uh, formerly with Citizen TV, and she is now the editor at large and founder of the Bank Media. We are also very much involved in providing solutions to large media organizations. Um, so we do this through training, um, mentorship, um, and also basically consulting. So we have meetings and, and, uh, and you know, with editors from large media organizations, we've been in talks with editors from uh, Nation Media Group to just understand how we can come, uh, come in in terms of uh, training the journalists in preparation um, for their digital um, future. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And then we have thought leadership in which, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, Nancy, can you take over? Sorry, Jockey. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to Jockey. Uh, I think she's not, uh, she's election challenges. But okay, yeah. so we'll, we'll come back to her. Um, and I guess at this point, then uh, maybe have Nigel uh, come on board and just uh, speak to us about what they're doing at uh, mm -hmm. 263 Chat. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much um, for this opportunity. Um, obviously, I started uh, 263 Chat. We actually turned eight yesterday. Um, so uh, we're trying, we're following in the footsteps of uh, Stilly, my big brother Stilly there, trying to get to the Big Ten um, if we can. And obviously, you know, media sustainability is, is, has been a, uh, an important part of um, our journey. We're trying, obviously, to, uh, to run a business. I've always, you know, spoken about, thank you, happy birthday. We've always spoken about how um, it's important to run these media organizations as businesses um, uh, and of course there are different models that you know we've you know around and we're obviously trying to experiment with that um, one of the ways that we decided to you know keep ourselves in business was to you know to really and it was really by accident so in 2014 we decided that uh, or you know the community as we like to call them so you know some people call them audience we like to call them the community we decided to build the brand around the community and um, sheer accident. Um, one of the mobile operators here decided to offer free Twitter. And of, of course, uh, history, we started off as a Twitter account and a hashtag, and we then evolved into an online publication. Uh, and obviously, you know, we publish uh, news uh, online only. Um, and uh, e effectively, in 2014, after the free Twitter uh, ran out, I think it lasted for six months, um, some of the communi community members asked us to um, you know, to create WhatsApp groups. And, uh, and initially I said, no, no, that's too much homework for us. And, um, and then they, you know, came back again. So no, 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 seriously. And so we've had WhatsApp groups since 2014. Those have now expanded uh, into different types of WhatsApp groups. Um, and so, and we've just responded to the community. So basically the community turns around and says, can I have a WhatsApp group <laughs> can I have a WhatsApp group? Cause I want to sell stuff, you know? And so we set up a classified WhatsApp group. And so we've got, you know, I don't know, almost 10 of those WhatsApp groups. Can I have a WhatsApp group for property and, and stuff? And so there's like two or three of those. 
Um, uh, someone asked us a few months ago, can we have a WhatsApp group for farming? You know, so we've got about five of those. Jobs and opportunities, so we've got another six of those. And so we've got a lot of WhatsApp groups that do different things. You know, we've got discussion groups, so we, they, they share the news, they discuss the news. Um, there's you know, sports, obviously. Uh, and there's you know, yeah, di different WhatsApp groups. Um, we've got different um, revenue streams. Uh, you know, and as you know, Stilly spoke eloquently about how they've the three, the three six two or three two six model. I need to copy that actually. Um, we we basically looked and said, look, you know, what are, what assets do we have? So we've got our website, we've got our social media. Um, of course, we've got the community. We offer a, a range of multimedia services because we've got cameras and stuff like that. And then um, three years ago in November, before the coup, not coup, we, we launched what we call the e-paper, electronic newspaper. And it was really born out of an idea because we were already in WhatsApp. There's, you know, obviously, you know, um, Trump came into office and uh, the term fake news started to become more and more popular. And so as a contribution, we decided um, how do we publish the news um, um, and share it through WhatsApp? And so what we started to do was to experiment in 2016 around taking the title, um, the, you know, the first paragraph and then the link. And the simple idea was to try and drive traffic to our website. Uh, that idea evolved um, because we started, you know, we started using more data. And the data showed, told us um, that, um, you know, obviously, you know, I think at the time about just below 50% of the population had internet access. But most of the people had a, you know, internet who had internet access, access the internet through a mobile device. And so when you look at the continent, you know, it, these are, you know, there's some, some glaringly, um, you know, sim similarities. And of course, they're young people. Uh, and then we dug a little bit deeper and we discovered that a lot of the people who access the internet actually use WhatsApp. And because of limited data, they, they don't Google, right? Uh, but for them, WhatsApp is actually the internet. So we decided, how do we play in and around this WhatsApp community? And we already had, we already had WhatsApp community then, but we weren't really optimizing it, as, as it were. Um, so we then launched what we call the e-paper. And initially, it was meant to be, um, um, you know, uh, it's a PDF of the week's news, actually. And uh, the idea was to send it out once a week on the Friday to tell people, when it was meant to be sent out for free, to tell people what actually happened that week. Um, prior to this, I'd actually asked the editor at the time, um, if because I always wanted to print, I always wanted to have like a physical copy, you know, and because I, you know, I'm, I remember my dad, you know, obviously, um, you know, he'd, you know, send me to go buy the newspaper um, and then uh, he'd sit and, and, and read the, the physical paper. And so I thought, oh, this would be great. We'll give it up, we'll give it away for free. Um, and, and, and the editor said, no, right? And so, you know, he said, no, we're not ready. And, and because of that, because of everything we're playing with the WhatsApp community, it, it literally pointed us into, you know, let's set up this e-paper. Um, and we've got an e-paper now, which we publish uh, every day, Monday to Friday. It's sent out with the news of the day at the end of the day. So it's, it, it's, it's sent out at about 7, 8 p.m. Uh, with that day's news. Um, it's sent via WhatsApp only, right? And it's sent to over 43,000 subscribers. So to give you a snapshot of what that actually looks like, when you add up the, the four daily publications in Zimbabwe, we are sending our e-paper to double the number of, um, so I think, you know, yeah. So, so, so basically our, 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 our print run, as it were, is double what mainstream media is doing. And we're sending this out to, um, to, uh, to people via WhatsApp only for free, right? Um, our DNA as an organization has always been to be very disruptive and we've uh, clearly disrupted the media landscape in Zim. Uh, we've brought the community closer um, to the news. We want them to be part of the story. We want them to be uh, our sources. We want them to correct us. We want them to, we want them to engage with us. We leverage our social media a lot. You know, I mean, we're on social media every day. I mean, there's someone managing our social media right now. 
talking, engaging, tweeting, liking, you know, doing all that sort of stuff across the platforms. And because of that, uh, we've got a, a large and growing social media uh, community, um, you know, who obviously rely on us uh, for the news. Um, we're, we're still trying to get to that. How do we generate revenue from them? Um, but for now, we've basically leveraged um, advertising. Uh, we would love to, to implement a, a membership model down the line, but I know that we're not there yet. Um, we are, we've, we've looked at, um, you know, a couple of things, you know, if, if we're going from left to right, you know, you've got the, you've got a website where, where we assume you've got you know, sufficient data to, to go online and read, you know, uh, the news, you know, our, our news whenever you want. And then when you move across, we've got the e-paper, which, which we created for uh, those who have limited internet access and WhatsApp, obviously. And then next we are looking at SMS. So how do we distribute news via an SMS? And then how do we, cause you know, once we've done that, then we, need, we can include more people. Um, so we're working on a model uh, right now. Um, it's under development and I've, I've probably, I've spent the last couple of months working with um, some developers around that. And that's also going to be a revenue stream. So we charge a nominal amount of money uh, daily and you, you receive your, your news via SMS. Um, you know, for us, uh, in sort of wrapping up, um, the community has, has, has got to be the heart of what we're doing. Um, you know, otherwise, what, when, why are we doing this, right? Um, but we want to amplify their voices. Um, you know, we do this a number of ways. If someone wants to write an opinion piece, you know, we'll look at it, we'll publish it, as long as it's not sexist, racist, et cetera, et cetera, all the usual isms, um, you, know, we're, you know, we're fine with that. We're trying to amplify different voices from different communities, especially the marginalized communities. So we, we are producing uh, quite a lot of content uh, around that. Um, you know, we've been doing some COVID reporting and we're looking at communities like, you know, those who are disabled or those who are living with limited uh, abilities, you know, shall we say, um, you know, how is COVID affecting them? So, you know, you try to include as many groups and along the way, uh, because you're seen to be, because you're, we're actually actively doing that, that also attracts um, certain kind of advertisers who probably are working in that space who then think, oh, if you're advocating for that particular group and they're also supporting, you know, similar uh, communities, you know, they 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 then want to partner with us. Um, we've we've managed to our reporting to stay, you know, but uh, we live in a highly polarized, highly politicized environment. State media is on the left, um, you know, um, traditional media is on the right, and we've plonked ourselves right in the middle and said, look, we want to tell the truth as we see it, and because we've done that, we've we've done it consistently. Um, we, 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 we've attracted um, some of the biggest, you know, companies who advertise with us. Um, and, 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 and I think we're, you know, we're punching above our weight, um, you know. And so, yeah, so, you know, we continue. I think the e-paper is going to be an important part of, of, of who we are. And, 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 of course, it generates revenue because adverts, you know, closed. Um, but that, I mean, that's us, uh, I guess, in short. Uh, yesterday, as I said, was our eighth birthday. Uh, incidentally, we also published our 600th issue of the e-paper. Um, as, as in, I haven't told the team that actually. Um, but um, you know, th those are those are some of the ways that we're um, trying to stay afloat uh, in these interesting COVID times that we're living in. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. We'll we'll come back to you. Um, uh, and happy birthday. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Jockey, are you, are you uh, able to speak now? Yes, I'm back. I'm, I'm okay. sorry about that. Yeah. So, like I was saying, basically, um, maybe I should just talk about um, the thought leadership activities um, that, that we are currently involved in. Um, we have our fireside chats in which we invite um, people across um, the media industry. Um, from tech and, and all other um, industries to talk about what they envision to be the future of, of journalism. And uh, we find this to be very refreshing um, conversations um, because, um, uh, you know, we get to understand um, the future of media and the future of journalism from different um, perspectives, whether it is from an academic perspective, um, tech background and, and all that. 
So that is us as the innovation center. Um, most importantly, what I'd like to highlight is that we recently uh, launched our call for applications for innovators in residence program. Um, so we are looking for good ideas in which we can invest in. Um, and this is across East Africa, that is Kenya, Uganda, and, uh, and Tanzania. So we're gonna pick um, one team from um, each country. And we're looking forward to seeing some really uh, brilliant ideas by young people. And the thing with this program is that we, don't, we do not accept um, individual applications. We only allow people to work um, in teams. And this is a model that we are actually seeing is working for us. Um, one of the uh, previous innovators in residence, that is uh, the debunk uh, media that is led by Asha Mwilu, um, is basically using explainer journalism to reach out to East African youth. So their target market is between um, 24 to 35 years, and they're basically explaining um, the headlines, talking to the young people in the language um, that they understand, essentially debunking the myth that young people in East Africa are just concerned with entertainment news because that is not a fact. The fact is that young people really do care about governance, about politics, um, they care about um, how their tax uh, is, is spent and, and about leadership. So they're using explainer journalism to talk about the issues um, uh, of uh, national issues and how they uh, directly affect young people. So of course they're tinkering with um, some very exciting um, storytelling uh, tactics such as uh, um, podcasting, uh, video and, and, and all that. The second team that we are supporting is the Ludic Works uh, team. So this is a team of, um, of developers. They're actually not journalists, but they're developers who have been developing um, apps for other clients and they want to understand how they can use um, uh, augmented uh, reality to, uh, as a platform for storytelling. So they're coming up with a platform in which journalists can load their stories and take advantage of the affordabilities of augmented reality to, to tell their stories. It's really quite interesting. We're looking forward um, to a launch of an MVP, a minimum viable product um, by the end of October. And this really essentially speaks to the future of journalism. Um, how, um, uh, you know, we cannot really conceptualize um, the future without thinking about partnerships across other industries, particularly um, tech. So that is the Innovation Center um, in a nutshell. Um, obviously, we are located in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Njoki. It would be interesting to hear from you, uh, maybe at some point, you know, how, how the bank is doing, uh, you know, having, having shifted uh, you know, their, their approach to, to storytelling and, and looking yeah. at a very different uh, segment of the population. But I'll turn it over to Daniel, um, who's sitting in a very interesting position, uh, not literally at the moment, but you know, by the, by the very nature of his, of his work as a general manager editorial at the Nation Media Group. And, and having listened to what Steely, Nigel, and, and Joki are you know, all trying out uh, you know, with, with uh, various degrees of success, um, First of all, how does this make you feel? And then two, um, what does this mean for you? And what are you doing uh, to, to, to survive? A, a context that has you know, different players, uh, new voices, different voices, um, at different players. Um, thank you, Nancy. How does it make me feel? I think that's the easiest question. It makes me feel very old. Um, when Steele is talking about Daily Maverick, you know, 10 years, and Nigel talking about eight years, and Jockey talking about the Aga Khan University program, which is, you know, a couple of years old, and you're from a media house that, you know, was started in the 60s. So I think it's an interesting perspective, uh, legacy versus the startups. Um, let me just give a bit of context in terms of the things that are happening around us. At the turn of the millennium, the newspapers uh, controlled 50% of the advertising revenue 
um, in the US market. Um, by the end of 2019, that share had dropped to less than 10%. And we're talking about a market that is $530 billion a year. So you basically have 90%, uh, rather 40% of um, a huge market that has basically disappeared in terms of revenues. <clears throat> now, in 2008, at the financial crisis, we saw revenues, advertising revenues dropping by about 25%. Um, but then they bounced back at the end of um, the crisis when, when there was a return to normalcy. What we're seeing now with COVID is a reduction of between 40 and 50% um, of uh, revenues that will not come back. So in some places there was a drop, you know, 80%, 90%, but you know, all the research that I've looked at, the most optimistic view is that um, 40 to 50% of the advertising revenue will actually not come back, certainly not to, um, to print. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, even uh, kind of the other legacy media uh, platforms like television and radio, um, we'll see uh, reductions. That's partly because of the economic impact as advertisers you know, keep their powder dry. Uh, it will also be as a result of you know, the disruptive impact of new ways of reaching people, which is social media and which is new media. So, that's the context within which you're operating. What COVID has done is it has basically truncated a 20 year slow decline into a six month, you know, shove the industry off the cliff moment, right? Um, so the, the downside is that many media houses are going to, um, I think, disappear, um, especially big legacy media houses that have large overheads that um, you know, can't react very quickly. And the upside is that it now forces uh, conversations that have been happening in media houses for decades. Um, you know, they go from something that you also discuss in terms of a digital strategy, in terms of monetization, to something that you actually have to do in order to, you know, be around by Christmas uh, this year, Christmas next year. So um, I'll speak very briefly about Nation Media Group and what we are doing, but I kind of want to speak more broadly about the legacy uh, media houses, so that it's not just idiosyncratic to, to the group. The things that I think need to happen or we're seeing happening in some places are that media houses have for a long time focused on the content um, and never really worried too much about the audience or understanding the audience very well. So if you take Audit Bureau of Circulation, um, all newspapers basically were decimated. If you look at the numbers from um, ABC South Africa, in fact, many of them didn't report. Uh, none, none of the newspapers reported uh, in the quarter from quarter to calendar year 2020. But very few media houses actually know where those readers went. Um, apart from advanced markets where people actually subscribe to a paper and you can know who has not you know, renewed their subscription, in markets where you're relying on on the street sales, um, when people disappear, you actually do not know where your audience has gone. So there is renewed understanding of the need to um, invest in the audience. Um, so there is focus away from just the content to um, data, um, who's reading your content, where are they reading it, how long are they staying on the page. Um, these are not new concepts, but there is now a very clear understanding that you need, once you put the content out, you need um, to understand its life cycle uh, in the market. And so the investments in that regard, the investments in you know, monetization. Now monetization, I think Steely gave a very uh, good overview in terms of one of the directions that uh, people have taken uh, in terms of then segmenting with the commercial, um, then the reader revenue um, and then other monetization opportunities. The challenge for media houses, legacy media houses such as ours, is that the fact that we have been successful for such a very long time is actually our biggest problem. Because if you've been making money hand over fist for 50 years, 60 years, then the culture is kind of embedded in the organization. And the changes that we 
think need to happen and some of the changes that we're undertaking within the group are not merely within the newsroom. They are changes within the organization itself because it's very clear now that the future of the political economy of the media will not be one that is dependent entirely or significantly on advertising revenue. It will be one that you know, increasingly relies on the audiences actually paying for the content. So you need to really look at the content because people are not going to pay for news. It's been commoditized, they can get it anywhere. You need to understand what kind of content people are interested in, what kind of content people will um, willingly pay for. And many times it's not content that we've paid too much attention uh, to. The New York Times, some of the um, kind of popular sections, cooking, recipes. I don't think there's any newspaper in Sub-Saharan Africa that has a cooking editor or that thinks that they will make money from cooking. Um, but you know, we're seeing, we're learning pretty much on the job about the kind of things that people are interested in. So uh, content, audiences, um, monetization, uh, there's paid content where you're getting money from your um, readers, uh, still mentions partnerships where you are going and tying up partnerships as we've done, for instance, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, it has its own challenges. You, 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 you will find media houses that go from one political economy that is subject to political and big business pressure to one that is subject to a big NGO or big uh, philanthropy pressure. That's something to be mindful of. But the biggest issue, I think, is the organizational change, the corporate change as institutions that have succeeded for many years then have to pretty much shake up um, the gospel, the, the, the first principles of their existence. And to do that whilst you know, um, be performing the role of a circus juggler, because in all legacy media houses, the, the old platforms are what make the money. So you still reliant um, on print circulation, you still reliant on advertising revenue, but you need to change your focus away from the things that pay your bills today in order to spend more management time, spend more innovation on things that currently don't bring you money. So you're, you're trading print dollars for digital cents and in order to have that conversation sustained and sold to all stakeholders, we're talking about the boards, we're talking about the principal owners, to go in and tell someone, cut me a check for a million dollars, I want to invest it in a digital strategy, which might or might not work, is a fairly difficult conversation. Um, and the final point I want to make is that with the crisis, when the crisis started, there was a flight to safety um, across pretty much the industry. Um, the US media houses have shared, shared, have shared about you know, 40% of jobs, uh, newsroom jobs in the last five or so years. Across Sub-Saharan Africa, we saw uh, either giants being sent home or uh, suffering pay cuts. Um, others will not you know, hire, others suspended hiring. So you're having that innovation happening at a time when media houses don't have either the resources or the appetite to invest in the three things that I think are important. So you need time to make the transition. You need the talent to build the content and to also build the new delivery mechanisms to do um, you know, kind of the new knowledge uh, of understanding audiences and so on and so forth, data coding and so on. But you also need treasury. You need to be investing uh, in the newsroom. So the, the existential challenge is how do you innovate at a time when you either don't have the resources to do so, or even where you have the resources, there is an instinctive need to protect um, what you have, keep your powder dry, or move it into uh, new areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Daniel and, and, and to uh, the rest of us for, for that very uh, insightful session. I, I noticed that, you know, Steely and Nigel, uh, you know, use the word community as opposed to audience, um, or, you know, use the two terms almost interchangeably. 
and you know, introducing an aspect of community, my, my question to you, the two of you is whether that then you know, has a bearing on um, uh, you know, just the changing perception among audiences when you view them as communities as opposed to audiences. Does that, does that shift how they respond uh, you know, to your platforms, how they respond to your content and how you engage with them? And then the second question, which you know, would be for all of us then, is um, you know, if, if we're then thinking about diversifying our revenue streams or our business models, and particularly looking at uh, philanthropy, uh, you know, how, does, how does that um, tie with editorial independence? Have you had instances where your editorial independence is compromised or challenged you know, as a result of you know, uh, money that's coming uh, you know, from, from, from some of these uh, sources? And I think that's a question that uh, very closely related to a question that had been shared earlier from one of the people that's in the session. So, Steely, uh, Nigel. Yeah, no, we're here. We're just, uh, <laughs> uh, You're just so being overly polite, and, Nigel. You go first. Yeah. <laughs> so, the question, thanks, Steely. Um, so, the question was around uh, community. Um, so, the thing is, you know, when you. We change our language, uh, you know, when we. I started 263 Chat as a discussion platform, right? And all it was was a Twitter account and a hashtag. So because of the way we started, we were already a community, okay? And, uh, you know, we used to have these discussions on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. local time. And, and so that thinking around, we need to involve these people. We need to take them along with our, on, you know, along the journey. Uh, was really how we, I mean, that's, that's all we know, really, you know? Um, so we, we've, we've, built, we've built the brand and, you know, our reporting, you know, includes them in, in so many ways. I mean, our WhatsApp groups, for example, especially the discussions one, you know, you, one of the editorial guys will, you can just jump in and ask a question, hey guys, what do you think about this? And they're doing that because they're just trying to test the waters or they're trying to get some opinion or, you know, um, us guys on the commercial side uh, obviously know that this is our community, but we haven't gotten to that point where Stilly and them have gotten to where they, they're talking about reader revenue, you know. For us, community is still the community. We're still wanting to include them in our, how we report on the editorial side. We just haven't worked out how to interact with them on the commercial side, if, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, once you start thinking of uh, the people who participate with us uh, and our content as, as uh, communities um, rather than just passive audiences, um, a lot changes. Uh, what you, how you speak to them, so you talk with them instead of to them, um, yeah. how and, and, and what you say also changes. Um, you know, it's not just a one way, it's not just a one way broadcast anymore. There's, there's bi-directional communication that's happening and, uh, and they're feeling heard, you know, and they're feeling a part of, uh, this, this relationship that they have with us. And I think when we start embracing that as, uh, as media publishers, our world gets better on, on a number of levels. Um, you, you have great engagement, you have. Uh, stronger support. You have people who are willing to participate in more ways than just being, again, a passive reader. They can feel like they're part of something. They're part of a mission. They're part of a cause. And and I think um, we, we try to build on that, um, you know, in increments because these are new concepts, especially for journalists who who come from legacy media that have joined us. And so. It's been a process of internal change management and piloting and championing and, and doing it in other ways. And so we can help that engagement seed spread into, uh, uh, into other parts of the business and, and the editorial uh, and the editorial team too. And I think someone raised the question of uh, independence. And uh, I think, look, there's no, um, uh, you know, we need money from somewhere, whether that's from advertisers, grant funders, readers, Money's got to come yeah. from somewhere, right? And you're never yeah. going to 
um, there's always going to be a risk that uh, you know you're going to be uh, susceptible. So I don't think that's anything new. If you take if you able to raise money from readers, or if you involve them in a crowdsource investigation, and you're asking them for data, like you know the the culture that you build within your organization and the rules and the guidelines that you you set as the leadership of of the newsroom and of the business will determine whether uh, any of that gets um, uh, violated. And 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 we obviously have been resistant to any interference from funders, whether those are grant or advertisers or whatever it is. And so that culture then spreads out into how we how we engage and deal with our with our readers as well. And so, you know, I actually think that it improves your your ability to be independent. Um, because if you're overly reliant on a single advertiser um, yeah. or grant funder, then the risk of that person or, or or support leaving becomes greater, and the impact of that is is far worse than if let's say one of the fourteen thousand members decides to stop supporting us because we wrote something about Donald Trump or a politician or wh whatever it is that they didn't like, and so it actually de-risks the financial independence uh, uh, issue uh, if you've got a bigger support base. Mm. I think so. I just, 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 just also just jump in there with with um, advertising revenue. Um, so I, I sit on the I sit on the commercial side of the business, and the editorial team do what they do. But what I found, what we found over the last couple of years is, um, you know, you can still write a bad story about the person who's advertising with you. Um, the difference is, you actually now have someone on the inside of that company who you can discuss or say, listen we found out that you are polluting river X in you know, an area, whatever the country, can we have a, can we have a, a conversation around that? Uh, as opposed to writing a story about someone you don't really know at all and struggling to find someone within the organization to comment. So there's different ways of, of looking at it. Um, and uh, yeah, we've, we've just found that it's, 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 you know, it's, it's the commercial side, you know, that's sometimes that, you know the line between commercial and um, um, and, and editorial can be blurry, but you know we've always tried to look at it like, well, actually we know someone in the company. Um, let's let's talk to them, um, and you know that that's that's another way. That's another uh, way of looking at that relationship. Thank you, uh, Joe Dindo has has had his hand raised for quite a while. Uh, Joe, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, yeah, this is to to Staley. Um, you 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 you've just launched a newspaper and you 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 referred to it at a time when others are closing down. Everybody is struggling. I just want to understand. Just go into more detail. What are you doing differently that uh, gives you confidence about its uh, its prospects? What is it that um, distinguishes your business model from what people have been doing? Um, jo Joseph, that's a, a question I've been asked about a thousand times in the last uh, 40, 45 days, and uh, um, I'm uh, going to share with you a, a much improved answer uh, <laughs> since I was since I was first asked the question. And I think the fundamental difference is this: is that uh, we're a digital first p uh, publisher. We were born in digital. We uh, learned to hustle and to make the digital side work and everything that we do is digital first and so we see the print product as a complementary addition to our, our existing uh, to the existing ways that we serve our readership right and, and, our, and our community and we saw that there was demand for a print product and uh, you know our readers from uh, surveys that we that we've seen uh, our readers still read print and read you know uh, people they still demand for the medium but people just didn't want to pay for for the quality that it ha, um, that was available on the market, and so that has been the decline in the in the paid for circulation. So it then becomes easier as a digital first publication to put out a print product than it is for a print product to be to digitally transform. You know, and I'll give you the example. Imagine you're a monthly magazine, right? And you publish once a month. You might have five or six features in a in a monthly magazine you fill the rest of the, the the copy and then that goes out into the world and then a month later you know you put out another edition 
for that kind of operation to then move into digital, to become relevant on an hourly basis from being relevant on a monthly basis, and then to have that digital operation threaten to cannibalize the print edition. Um, you, you, you know, that is the biggest challenge that publishers have been facing around the world and that frankly, very few organizations have got right. And that is why we're seeing so many closed down. Whereas if you're born in the fire of digital and, you make, and you're able to make that work, you can then go into print the other way a lot easier than, uh, than vice versa. And I think that is the difference because, you know, we were able to launch a weekly publication that is, you know, making a claim for the best newspaper in, you know, in the country. And that's our ambition is to produce the best newspaper in the country. And we've had to hire, I think, 12 new people in order to make that happen. And so the marginal cost for us to produce a quality publication like this is way, way less than uh, any other traditional publisher who's coming in from a legacy perspective. And, uh, you, know, you know, our circulation numbers are already at a, at a level that are higher, is higher than, you know, um, publications that have been around for decades. Thank you, uh, Stevie. And, and I guess this then, uh, you know, a, a lot of the work that's being done in the legacy media, there is a push to the, you know, towards a digital first strategy. But going back to what you've just said, that you started on that space, the challenge for, um, uh, you know, the legacy media is that they started off on a particular platform, on, you know, hard print, um, and now are trying to revert to a digital first strategy. Uh, without necessarily thinking about what that would look like. You know, a lot of them transferring what is ideally print content onto the digital space and whether that then has a return on investment is something that is worth is worth noting. I, I don't know whether Daniel wants to comment about this because I know the push, for example, at Nation Media Group has been, you know, let's adopt a digital first strategy, but to what extent are we doing that without necessarily carrying with us uh, you know, a lot of what we have done in the traditional spaces. And, and that then, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, um, interfering with, uh, you know, the digital fast strategy. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I mean, was speaking before the call to Stilly, and we're, we're all watching with um, interest uh, the experiment of the Daily Maverick. Um, because, uh, not just because of the pivot to print, but also because a few years ago, we thought that the digital native startups were the future. Um, we're talking about HuffPo, um, Vice, Buzz, um, and which, you know, um, all kind of floundered uh, one way or the other. So uh, I'm not saying that they, they will, and I actually hope that they don't, um, but it would be interesting to see um, our own kind of homegrown um, disruptions uh, I mean, commercially viable. The, the problem that the industry did was actually when, when the internet kind of around was to go to the, to take an analog mindset to a digital landscape. Exactly. So fashion cycle are basically, you spend the day, you know, incubating a product. Once it's perfect or near perfect, you then push it out and then you resume the next day. So many media houses that claim to have a digital last strategy actually have a digital last strategy. They do, you know, they use Facebook, they do a bulletin, and then they put it online. So we misread the industry, we misread the dynamics, we misread, um, you know, the audiences. We didn't understand the audiences. So media houses, that's, that's the point I was making about changing the organization itself. Media houses that think they can merely bring their heft, their size, and put it online, will be found out you know, fairly quickly. The media houses that have succeeded, you know, if you look at the New York Times, um, which I think is a bellwether in terms of the transformation of a legacy media house into a digital one, is that they had to unlearn many things. They had to admit not knowing enough. They had to be humble. They had to make investments, investments in talent, the, the New York Times has been hiring journalists where other media houses have been letting them go. They had to bring new skills through the door. You know, um, the New York Times 
when we visited them a few years ago, they had 36 software engineers, software engineers in a newsroom, in a media house, right? Trying to see how do you project content on a bathroom mirror in the morning when people are shaving, you know, to have stock listings or to have, you know, headlines, futuristic stuff. Uh, we're talking about wearables then. Now, you know, uh, the watches are you know, kind of ubiquitous. So legacy media houses um, are at a disadvantage in the sense that they have to unlearn very many bad habits that have accumulated over the years. We also, however, have the advantage in that if you look around in many places, we still have the biggest audiences, even online. So the nation media group, um, you know, when you put our audiences together online, they are bigger than Facebook across East Africa. Right? So if you think about that, that's, that's a massive um, advantage to begin with, right? And in many ways, it's ours to lose. If we just continue to do what we've done for 50 years and merely put it on you know, mobile phones, then we will collapse. If we are humble, if we understand, if we um, iterate, learn to do things and correct them down the road, rather than try to perfect them before they roll out, if we build the right partnerships, if we understand technology, if we understand the network effects, I think the big media houses have um, you know, a head start over the startups. The other thing I need to mention just kind of very briefly is that what we've seen is that for every New York Times or Guardian or FT that basically breaks out, you know, there are 100, you know, 200 um, media houses that actually collapse. Um, so Gannett, the biggest newspaper group in the US, um, had fewer digital subscribers um, a few months ago than the New York Times increased just at the beginning of the year, right? So the growth in the NYT was bigger than the overall that these guys had. And, you know, they have 100 plus newspapers across the continent, across, across America. So we're going to see many failures and few winners. Um, and you know, there are questions there about diversity, there are questions about, um, you know, just the variety of news and information that will be um, available to uh, the audiences. Thank you, Daniel. And, and maybe as, as uh, you know, we take the next, I think there's a hand up uh, from Francis Mkule. Francis, can you hear us? Unmute yourself. Okay, as he's trying to do that, I, I guess the, the two questions here. Uh, there's a question to Nigel, whether you've been able to generate revenue using the classified WhatsApp groups that you're creating, uh, and if you could expound on that a little. And, and that, you know, the question that I had for Joki earlier about, you know, uh, to what extent has the bank been successful? And then what metrics then would you be gauging their success? Is it by virtue of the number of subscribers? Uh, you know, uh, new revenue streams, have they been able to make any money or is it content, is it engagement? You know, what does that look like considering that you put in seed money? You know, are you seeing, you know, some sort of results uh, in that space? Uh, and then there's a question, I guess this would then go to Steely and to uh, Nigel. What are some of those mechanisms that one can employ or can be employed to build the community? Uh, that is sustainable uh, for uh, content creation or, or a media house. So mechanisms for building that, that sense of community. I know you alluded to that uh, in your earlier responses, but maybe just shed some light for uh, you know, the person who has raised that question. Great. So Njoki first and then okay. um, Stiley okay. and Nigel. Okay, um, thank you, Nancy. So, well, in the case of Debunk, they, they launched um, on, on 1st of, of July and it was really um, amazing to see um, them launch after several months of, of work. And, and you know, um, the question that they, they're being asked left, right and center is how do you dare launch in the middle of a pandemic? But what many people don't realize was that this was actually a culmination of several months um, of, of work. So obviously the bank has grown in terms of uh, 
um, subscribers, and I'm not talking about paying subscribers, but in terms of the views on their content on YouTube, and they are actually um, reaching out to the 24 to 35 um, age group, the under 35s. Now, but I will speak generally. Um, I don't want to limit this answer to everywhere, to, to just debunk. I just want to speak generally from a media startup perspective. Now, the one thing that we need to realize is that COVID-19 and the digital disruption um, as a whole has basically made most media organizations in East Africa, including Nation Media Group and Standard Group, basically has, it has reduced them into a startup. Um, or a small, uh, small, uh, or an SME or MSME. So many media organizations right now, news media organizations, including the big um, nation media groups and everyone else, they are finding themselves in a place where they have to start from scratch. So everyone who is doing media right now in the age of the digital disruption is in one way or another a startup. So let's just get that right. And when we talk about um, sources of revenue, uh, of course, the debunk model is uh, for now um, grants, philanthropy, and all that, what you call philanthrojournalism. But they're going to be looking at other interesting business models in the future, including memberships, um, a paywall perhaps in the future that is paid content, and a bit of advertising. And that is actually the same across even for Nation Media Group because Nation Media Group and other organizations are looking at a reader revenue uh, based um, uh, you know, funding model. But the thing is, and I think it's one thing that we're not all looking at is that each of these business models that we're talking about, whether it's uh, philanthropy, whether it's advertising or even reader revenue, each of these, whether it is for a startup or even for the legacy media organizations, each of this has its own limitations. You know, when you talk about philanthropy, there's the issue, philanthropy and advertising, there's the issue of uh, press freedom. Um, how do you um, do a story on Safaricom if Safaricom is your key advertising? Um, and the issue of reader revenue, um, for what we charge for reader revenue is it's just a small fraction of the amount that it takes to produce one newspaper, for example, or even that story. Reader revenue cannot really um, be profitable unless it is in the scale of the New York Times. If you're talking about East Africa, um, in that case, reader revenue, the hockey stick model is going to take a very long time. So perhaps we need to think about other models such as um, can we do fundraising? Um, would, it be a, would it be the time to talk about an alternative source of revenue that would in, uh, in which the profits are going to be plowed back to fund journalism? Um, and you know, in the case of South Africa, um, we've seen what NASPAs have, have done. I'm sorry to use the example of NASPAs given its very dark history as a colonial newspaper, but what happened with NASPAs is that they invested in a small company called Tencent in China a couple of years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and they got a significant return on investment, the highest ever in the history of investments, 10,000% investment, which is now being channeled back to the business. So perhaps this could be an opportunity for not just legacy media organizations, but also even the startups to think about alternative sources of, of revenue. The New York Times is, is doing it very well with their, with their T brand studio that is, um, uh, that is native advertising, that perhaps this could be the time maybe to invest in something else and channel back the cash to fund uh, journalism. Because really, even when you talk about reader revenue, unless you're talking about significant numbers, right now, New York Times has about 5 million paying subscribers, 4.5 million of those um, being digital subscribers. Um, and, and you can see, like Kalinaki pointed out, um, New York Times had an increase in the first quarter of 2020. I think they increased by 587,000 um, subscribers 
which is actually more than the local newspapers and other smaller newspapers put together. So this reader revenue model, the problem for me would be the fact that it's a winner takes it all kind of uh, situation, whether in the case where it's either New York Times or nothing else. So we cannot have all this. So for me, I think in terms of, of startups, um, philanthropic journalism looks very attractive. Um, advertising model, um, you can't compete with Facebook. Even New York Times is not competing with Facebook and, and Google. Um, reader revenue has its own uh, uh, you know, limitations, but I, I think I would go for alternative um, sources of revenue. And that is one of the things that we are trying to interest um, our startups and the editors that we are speaking to that don't just look at what other people have done. Perhaps this could be a time um, to, to think about other avenues. Thank you. Let me just chime in there to, to, to buttress a point. Um, I mean, we referenced a lot about the New York Times, um, but you know, they, they operate in a different ecosystem. Um, and you know, uh, literacy levels, uh, affinity, you know, economy. Um, so mm. it, it's a, a disadvantage for us in Sub-Saharan Africa because we don't have um, as many, um, you know, they, the fundamentals are different and we don't have many examples, which is why we're very keen on the Daily Maverick example to see if there are models that are closer to home that um, we can replicate. Um, so the, the, even the philanthropic model, if you look, for instance, wider at civil society, how many NGOs or civil society organizations are able to raise um, revenue from local sources? Um, many of them still rely on foreign donors. So I think there's a reality test that's coming for us in the media industry that many of the things that we see working elsewhere will not necessarily be replicable uh, in our environment. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Steely and Nigel, I think the questions about monetizing the space. Uh, uh, Steely has talked about, you know, the fact that they've been able to make some money. Uh, would you like to shed more light on that? How does it look like uh, for you now? Are you in a good space? Uh, are there certain uh, inhibitions that you have going forward or certain concerns? And for Nigel, how are you able to monetize that, uh, you know, that space? And then after you've responded, we have uh, my colleague uh, from University of Johannesburg, Dumisani Moyo, who will, uh, who has you know one or two things to say, and uh, Sue Valentine as, as well. Okay, I'll um, I'll uh, offer some some thoughts on um, on the reader revenue uh, model. I have, a, I have a different take on it. I don't think you need five million subscribers to make it work. Um, with the reader revenue model. Uh, we've seen in our case how um, our lives have changed drastically, you know, even once we got a couple thousand members on board and there are, there are massive benefits to be had, not only financial, but I can also say that, you know, our, our team has doubled in size in the last two years. Um, we're about uh, just over 80 people now. Um, and there, I think wow. there are very few very few organizations in the world that have had a doubling in, in, in the size of the organization and the newsroom. And a big part of that was because of the, the support and the growth of the, of the membership program and the, the financial benefits that, that growth that we, we keep seeing every, every month we're adding new members. Um, April was our biggest month, uh, individual month for membership uh, as we hit the hard lockdown. And then I think we hit our biggest month again in June and July, and then August was our biggest month ever as well. So, you know, and we're seeing now at 14,000 that, um, and we, we, we let members choose the amount of the contribution, financial contribution that they want to make. Um, we see how that is now covering a third of our payroll, even after we've doubled uh, the organization uh, in size. So uh, I don't think you need millions. Thousands will make a big difference. Uh, I imagine for a lot of uh, people who are on, you know, in, in media startups uh, or in media, medium-sized organizations such as ourselves. So, um, and that's how, how we, and, and how we went about building that community was we obviously had an existing, you know, we'd, be, we'd spent eight years of, of uh, developing our audience and our readership and our community over that time. And we just needed to tweak uh, and ask, 
and ask people to join us and to join our cause. And we, we built up that loyal following over the years. And so we just needed to find where they were. Where are your most loyal and engaged readers? How do you find them? And for us, um, we had fortunately built up a strong newsletter effort since day one. We'd invested in newsletters in 2009 before they were cool and they were, you know, a big part of the of the media strategy, and so uh, that was the first place we went to. Uh, we also put messages at the end of our articles, and because we do mostly long form journalism, if you're going to read to the end of a thousand or fifteen hundred word article, um, you're going to find some of your most loyal and engaged readers are the people who read to the end. Um, simple, but you know, uh, that's where we had our initial success, and so we realized that. Um, growing our community and, and growing our membership was going to be uh, also attached to the growing of our newsletter suite and, and our newsletter subscriber base. And so we focused heavily on, on, we invested more in growing our newsletter base. So every time I speak to people about a membership uh, model, um, it's basically underpinned by a newsletter strategy. And, uh, and, and for us, we, we can't divorce the two and I, there's so many benefits from um, grow, having a good newsletter strategy. Um, it helps with uh, engaged readers. It helps know who those readers are. It drives traffic to the website. It drives advertising revenue and it drives our membership program as well. And so I always recommend that having a strong newsletter game is fundamental to growing any membership or, or reader revenue program as well. Yep. Um, so I'll just jump in there. Um, someone asked a question about uh, any luck with the uh, the classified WhatsApp groups. Um, no. So you know our WhatsApp groups um, are not. We don't. We, we didn't create the community to make money from them. Um, if you happen to sell, I don't know your used chair to someone. Um, in our minds, you. 26 we chat facilitated for that to take place and um and if you're going to speak about us uh positively we enabled you to you know uh, we 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 created a, a community for, for you to do that um and so we're not looking for any financial benefit uh what we're actually hoping for is if you are um an sme or you know a, a mom and dad business and you're selling i don't know um diapers or something you know um as an example you will then eventually um grow to a point where you will then advertise with us and if you if we if we really got that relationship with you then it's it's an easier um, conversion uh, as it were so whether you advertise with us or not um you know the community is still there um and and like i said we 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 decided to 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 build a community around where the people are. And I think Stilly just alluded to that, um, you know, just now, you know, find where your individual, where your, your organization's community is and, 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 and create the community around that. And so we've got different kinds of community. I mean, we've got the, the guys on Facebook and, you know, the guys on Twitter and the guys on Instagram or wherever they are. And, you know, um, and, you know, obviously we are different. Uh, we use these platforms differently, right? Depending on, 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 on our preference. And so uh, our thing is just to, to just remain engaging um, and to actually, you know, for now, give our, our news uh, for free. I, you know, I've, I've always said we're not going to sell the e-paper. That's not the business model. You want to ensure that you um, save your money, you buy a smartphone, you buy the data, you get the e-paper, and that should really be your cost. The advertiser should really... Um, pay um, and that, that's how we generate our revenue um, like I said with our SMS um, project that's a different kind of model um, someone's got to pay for the SMS and so we're going to put a nominal amount um, for uh, the receiver the recipient uh, the subscriber um, to pay and so that's that's how we're going to uh, work with that um, the newsletter we've we've been toying around with the newsletter like you know obviously learning um, lessons from Stillian and and and, and uh, the guys at Daily Daily Maverick, you know um, it we just we have to rejig uh, the editorial team and so we're not yet ready to do that, um, 
yeah yet um it's a sort of a 2020 it's a 20 oh, it's 2020 now so it's the 2021 plan um probably like a january plan so we'll see how we, we go for the rest of the year um yeah but yeah i, I think i've answered uh, the question there have i Yes, you, you've, yeah, answered, I mean, you've answered the question. Uh, cool, cool. Do we, Sue? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a, okay. Yeah. Do me, you, uh, can you go. hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank, thank you so much. No, I, I just want to thank all the, all the speakers for the really wonderful presentations, quite mind blowing things that they are doing uh, to innovate and stay stay ahead of the curve as it were in terms of uh, continuing to provide excellent journalism. Because I think the time where we are now needs more good journalism than less. So I think what, uh, what, what I'm hearing is quite a lot of interesting, innovative ways of coping but I think this it testifies to you know the need for a lot of hard work uh, that has to take quite a, a lot of time, and I don't think there are uh, shortcuts that one can make in some of these things. So when you look at uh, Daily Maverick, I think it's been quite a, a fascinating journey of uh, experimentation and innovation, and it was quite interesting to hear uh, the shift that they are making. Uh, towards print, but also the staying focused on on, on the community, on on, on audiences, um, which is similar to what uh, Nigel has also been talking about with two six three, which I, I which I have watched grow for many years and uh, keeps innovating, keeps uh, challenging itself to 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 uh, keep providing useful information. Um, I think this is quite quite a lot of take homes, which I think uh, can be used by others trying to innovate. I think the starting point that Nancy made about you know these job losses and what can be done uh, to to assist or to harness uh, the talent that is being lost in what uh, in the South African context people are calling a bloodbath in journalism. I think that these are the kind of things that we have been preoccupied with uh, as we sort of brainstormed around this webinar to say, uh, what can be done to save journalism? What can be done to assist people that, are, uh, I mean, journalists that, that are losing jobs, but that can actually continue to provide excellent journalism? Um, I, I think this has been really, a wonderful uh, presentation. I really liked uh, Daniel's uh, interventions, the uh, very thoughtful and incisive analysis of that shift from legacy media to the startups and what sort of seems to hold back the legacy media uh, into the routine, into the usual. Uh, and, it, and, and just how, thinking about how COVID has pushed all of us uh, to think differently uh, and to, in a very short space of time, uh, uh, see the importance of actually uh, uh, thinking outside the box and finding new ways of existing. I think this, these are very uh, important uh, issues that we need to keep discussing uh, in this space uh, to talk about you know, you know, the future of the media in this uh, challenging environment. Questions around editorial independence. When you look at the mix of new funding models that is existing, that that is emerging, are also things that I think uh, uh, we, we we need to keep at the back of our, of our minds. What kind of restraining measures can be put in place to make sure that uh, you still, you know, retain that high degree of independence, even as you take uh, funding from philanthropy, from the commercial side, and also even from those generous readers, because uh, some of them are not your, your, your small individual readers. They are 
people of, of you know, who have money, who have resources that can actually sway journalism if uh, given the opportunity. So I think there's a lot that has come up that, that we need to sort of keep engaging with and uh, uh, keep mindful of, mindful of as, we, as, we, as we look into the future of journalism. So thank you very much for, for this very stimulating conversations. I think it's, 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 it's a very good start in my view for uh, further engagement on this, uh, on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dumi. You've actually, you know, uh, done what Ali Khan was to do, so, and you've done it very, very well. You know, summarizing what uh, the deliberations, uh, you know, um, have basically highlighted this afternoon. Uh, Sue, I'd like you to have a final word on this, and then, you know, we call it today. Uh, thanks, Nancy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, um, we can. Oh, good, good. Um, thanks, thanks so much. I just wanted to, I see we, we, we're right at the end of the, our time, um, to thank the panelists indeed for some really thoughtful words. And one challenge perhaps to leave or to a question that I wanted to, to pose um, during the conversation was, you know, we're talking very much about uh, these are fantastic models, but I think they still tend to serve uh, if we go even from the New York Times to the Daily Maverick uh, to, the, to the nation, serve elite audiences in the big cities. Uh, and I, I, I wonder how we be, can begin to think about the opportunities that exist with these new media models to reach people living in, in the smaller towns, the smaller cities who are living many, in many places in news deserts uh, without news that is relevant to their lives, that speaks to, to their environment and the issues that they're affected by. And, and, and are these models perhaps things that we can think about with sometimes with some of the journalists who sadly are being laid off from these larger media houses? Um, is that an opportunity? Because I think that these are communities, if we take an audience centric approach, these are communities that are ignored underserved, but who absolutely are citizens who have an interest in the country, who have the right to vote, but are not getting the kind of information that uh, enriches their lives. Um, and so just a, a challenge, how do, we, how do we replicate these models um, with the benefits of digital uh, and perhaps with a print supplement um, to really serve audiences that I think are, are largely ignored. Um, and thank you so much for, for the panelists for, for all the presentations. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sue and, and Dumi for chiming in. Um, thank you to the panelists for, for being so transparent and vulnerable with this conversation so that we are coming together as a community to face the media sustainability question. Um, and thank you to the 30 plus audience members who joined us for this conversation. We will definitely keep you uh, in the loop of future conversations around this and, and any th other work that we do around the topic. Um, once again, thanks you to every thank you to everyone and we will see you soon. Thank you, bye.